Welcome to Second Opinion, the review show here on the Nexus. Today, Tanushree Buck, Ian Buck, and Ian Decker will be sharing their thoughts on Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO16. So before we start, important note, for those of you who have not seen the movie yet, we are going to have two sections to this podcast episode. The first section will be spoiler free. Dun, dun, dun. That's not the that's not the scary one. The second one is the scary one where we have spoilers. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so you know what actually I think I think what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to go back and take that sound effect and I'm going to put that as the transition between the spoiler free version uh, part and the spoiler version. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, um, so yeah, the, this first part, spoiler free, um, we're going to give our overall thoughts of, on the movie, um, you know, some of its strengths, some of its weaknesses, whether it was a good movie or not, that kind of thing. And then in the second part, we'll get into some more, like, plot point specific things that we, that we noticed in the movie. Yes. Uh, so I've actually, I've heard a bit of confusion among people, uh, on what Rogue One is. Um, I had a student who told me that he thought that it was going to be, like, the sequel to a Force, The Force Awakens. Nope. Nope. Yep, that's not the case. Um, so before you go and watch Rogue One, it's definitely important to know where in the timeline it exists. Uh, and... It's the sequel to the prequels. It's... Y yes. Or it's the prequel to the original trilogy. <laughs> so the prequel is the sequel. Yeah, no, the sequel, because the, se the sequel is 7, 8, and 9, right? Right? Or is it? I think so? <laughs> <laughs> I th Actually, I'm not sure what people are calling the new trilogy that's happening. It's like if the Lion King one and a half was just the Lion King half. <laughs> or the uh, Borderlands, the, the pre-sequel, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so Rogue One takes place like literally days and hours before A New Hope, which is the original movie. Um, and so it's actually kind of a fascinating thing because we've had like the overall plot summary of Rogue One for over 30 years now. Uh, because the opening crawl from A New Hope uh, stated, it's a period of civil war. Rebel spaceships striking from a hidden base have won their first victory against the evil Galactic Empire. During the battle, rebel spies managed to steal secret plans to the Empire's ultimate weapon, the Death Star, an armored space station with enough power to destroy an entire planet. I thought you said there weren't going to be spoilers until later. Well, it's not a spoiler if we've known it, if we've known it for 30 years, isn't oh, really? it? I think. I, <laughs> if you go in, okay, if you go into this movie having never seen the original movie, you're insane. Nothing's going to make any sense. Nothing's going to know. So Rogue One tells the story of those rebel agents, those spies who stole the plans and got the plans to Princess Leia. Rebels. Yeah, rebels! <laughs> Alright, so spoiler free thoughts. Uh, I thought that it was really interesting to see the things that they kept kind of similar to previous, like other Star Wars movies and things that they did differently, because this is easily the most different. Star Wars movie of all, right? Um, all the way from, like, the title, which is, you know, usually they are Star Wars episode something and then, like, the actual name of the movie. This time, the name of the movie comes first. Yeah. It's Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Um, and so that's that's really kind of signaling that this is the first one of the movies that they are making that is outside of the core trilogies, right? The, yeah. the main big galactic events. The side art. Yeah, yes. yeah. Even though it does actually have a lot of important things that impact the rest of the galaxy, right? Because yeah. if they hadn't stolen those plans, the Death Star wouldn't have been destroyed in Episode Four, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes. But yeah. Um, and actually, the the title was kind of intended, I think, to be a pun because not only is it like in universe significant, the the title Rogue One, but also this is like the the road like when you take all of the movies as as a whole this is the rogue one right yeah <laughs> it's a different inflection on it yes so um they also yeah they 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 start off the movie like right off the bat uh very differently they don't have an opening crawl you're right they didn't no yeah there's there's no paragraphs explaining the situation to the audience or anything like that they just boom put us in space there's a spaceship and we're into the story which is a lot more modern, I think. Yes. 
was I the only one who was bugged by some of the stuff with the characters? Um, like, I felt that the the monk was kind of stereotypical. Yeah. Really stereotypical. Um, and... They were, de- they were definitely playing with a lot of tropes. A lot of existing tropes. Yeah. That's for sure. Because the characters felt like, I've seen all of these characters somewhere before, none of this is new. And I mean, there, there is also the, the whole thing of, don't broke or <laughs> don't fix what ain't broke. Um, don't, don't broke what ain't fixed. But also, if we're trying to make, like, a movie that's totally different, right? You want to push some boundaries, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so not just... I guess they were taking formulas from outside of Star Wars as well, um, but they weren't reinventing the wheel. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the dynamic duel between the monk and the, the heavy guy. Mm-hmm. So the, the lightweight character versus the heavy character is one that's all over the place, obviously. The... A sassy droid. A sassy droid. <laughs> Actually, he was my favorite character. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but I mean, watch. Mm-hmm. Watch. Yeah, great. Oh man, great casting though. Yes, I loved. Yeah, I loved the cast in this movie. Um, but yeah, uh, like the the characters themselves, other than their overall like archetypes, right? Yeah, I I couldn't remember any of their names after we watched the movie. I couldn't remember like there wasn't anything significant really about them as a person that I could remember. I just remembered what their purpose was to the plot of the movie. Yeah. Right. I, I all I remembered was the characters that I've seen before, all like the characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like there wasn't very many, but Right, yeah. Um and that that was that's kind of the weird position that it's in, right, is that Star Wars has existed for thirty years and everybody's had all this time to get used to the characters, yeah. you know, and so then... Like then I, they give us new characters that were just like, where did these people come mm-hmm. from? I don't, I don't even remember a time in my life where I didn't know who Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, and Princess Leia were, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's it's really hard to know whether or not, after watching the original movie, if I would have felt a connection to the characters or not. Mm. Because, you know, that was just so long ago in my life. Yeah. I was a tiny child. Um, yeah, they, and they, and they kind of sprinkled cameos from from like the original movie into this movie um because it, it being that it's set like literally days before they put in a lot of effort into making it feel like it was right there in the same time period um everything from like the costuming to the types of like computers that they're interacting with right um all sorts of stuff the you know and, and then specific characters who show up um who are from like you know, the Rebel Alliance who we're used to, um, you know, Imperial officers who we see later on in, in yeah. the next movie. Yeah. And some of the characters, though, didn't make sense. Like, Sassy Vader. <laughs> yeah. We, we'll get into that a little bit later, I think. <laughs> but yeah. So, yeah, some of them, they treat it a little differently than we're used to. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's halfway between Edgy Vader versus Broody Vader. <laughs> Vader. He's, he's going through a different phase right now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Maybe oh man, is there are there any emo Darth Vader Twitter accounts yet? I hope so. To go along with our emo Kylo Ren. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> like oh my god. Nobody wants to. Um, this is the first Star Wars movie that was not composed by John Williams. Who composed it? Some Italian guy, I think. Yeah. Uh, I, oh, I should have written down his oh, name. Wait, that's right. Uh, Corey was talking to me about him. Um, oh shoot! What else has he done? Let me look him up quick because that is worth talking about. Yeah, he was he was definitely um, a, a good composer and is known for being a very good composer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and he Lennon? did uh, no. no the the new guy. Um, and he actually I, from the stories that I've heard, he had like maybe a month to compose the whole movie, oh, which is crazy. Yeah, because I think they had somebody else and then they like switched um, switched composers right at the last minute. Michael Giacchino. There you go. Giacchino. But yeah, he did he did a really good job of like kind of taking the John Williams feel um and then adding in new stuff. Um one thing that he didn't do was uh like John Williams in each movie that 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 each Star Wars movie, right? Um is he would add one really big musical piece that was like unique to that movie. Um so things like Imperial March, right? That that was brought in in uh, episode five, um, the like battle of the fates, right? Where where Darth Maul, exactly, yeah. 
so th those are like specific ones that you hear them and you know exactly which movie they're from. Um, I don't know if there are any of those in in Rogue One. It didn't seem like it to me. Right. Well, surprise, surprise. Um, yeah, and I don't, I don't, I see what you're talking about. I don't remember any one specific thing, but Michael Giacchino actually has a pretty impressive track record. Uh, he's done Ratatouille. <laughs> I know, right? Number one. What an, inter what an interesting start. <laughs> um, Lost. <laughs> Cars 2. Up. Um, let's see. Doctor Strange. Star Trek Beyond. Zootopia. Jurassic World. So he's getting up in there with a bunch of the Disney people. Mm -hmm. So like, sort of, he's he he was Inside Out, yeah. He was also Inside Out. Maybe they just had him like in the studio there, and they're like, "Hey, <gasps> hey, we're doing the Star Wars movie. Do you want to just like write some things?" <laughs> he's like, "Okay, <laughs> sure, sure." Uh, and then the last thing that I wrote down that they did very differently in Rogue One than any other Star Wars movie is they had like lower thirds. When we were switching from one planet to another, they would write out what planet we're on now, which was very, like, I felt like it was necessary in this movie, definitely, because especially at the beginning of the movie, we were, like, jumping around from planet to planet very, very quickly, and none of them were planets that we had ever heard of before. Yeah. But in pretty much all of the other Star Wars movies, we're jumping around from planet to planet that we've never heard of before, and, like, people just deal with it. So it was it was kind of strange to see. But nice, too. It's it's a nice strange. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like me. I, yeah, I kind of feel like that's something that they should have been doing all along. Um, especially since then people wouldn't be confused about like the spelling of planets and stuff like that. Kashyyyk. Yeah, exactly. How do you spell Kashyyyk? It's got three Ys. Three Ys in a row. So K-A-S-H, it's spelled Kash. Kashmian yep. Kashyyyk. Yeah, yeah. K-A-S-H-Y-Y-Y. K. <laughs> Uh, same, same reason that like Wookie has no why an why why I e e at the end of the word. It does. Yeah, that's how you spell Wookie. Oh, I thought it was just W O O K I E. Yep. Nope. There's two e's. <laughs> oh man. No Wookie. Okay. Wookie. Say it right. Wookie. Yes. <laughs> and actually, I think the reason that I know how to spell Wookie is just because of Wikipedia. Like I had to, I oh I had God. to learn that in order to search for Wikipedia. Beautiful. <sighs> All right. Um. Yeah. And then, like, I was just amazed at the things, like the things that they did to make it feel like it was consistent with the original movie. Though, were just like, just like spot on, you know. So, um, I mentioned the costuming. And that was one thing that I, like, I kind of struggled with the first time that we watched Rogue One, was I was looking at all these people, these rebels running around in costumes that I strongly associate with the Rebel Alliance, right? And I was like, why aren't these stormtroopers, like, recognizing them? Like, why aren't they? Oh, right. Because, like, at this point, the Rebel Alliance hadn't been, been a... It wasn't, it wasn't, like, a large military force yet, a well-known, you know. And so, <laughs> so that kind of makes sense. Um also, just, like, hearing the same sound effects that they used in the original trilogy, that was, like, I don't know. I <laughs> You may have noticed that I really like audio formats. Mm -hmm. And so, like, so, <laughs> so hearing hearing those same sound effects was just, like, like, coming home to me. I was just like, oh, man. Like, it all fits. <laughs> See, I wouldn't have noticed that, but... Glad that we have you here to notice it more. <laughs> Especially, like, specifically, it was like the X-Wing fighters laser sounds. Uh, yeah. Because um, I've watched the the Battle of Yavin in A New Hope way too many times. Like so many times that if I'm listening to the soundtrack, I can identify exactly what's happening in the battle by the musical cues in the song. Yeah. <laughs> Such a nerd. Yeah, that's me. Gosh, go throw your D20 somewhere, nerd. <laughs> Oh man! Hey, we should probably play uh, like the Star Wars role playing game sometime. We can do that. That would be fun. Continuing, I thought that the visual effects that they used in this movie were really, really good. A little bit overdone in a couple of places. Like there were some some like smoke effects that were just like, okay, I can't see anything anymore because you just put too much smoke. Um, it wasn't <sighs> nearly as bad as like The Force Awakens, which had you know J.J. Abrams's uh, lens flares in a few places and like just tons of smoke uh all over the place could be worse 
Could be Michael Bay. Yeah, that's true. Oh man. <laughs> But <laughs> I, wa- I watched Transformers last night without like Why and the well because I was over at Declan's house and we'd already watched two movies and then he put in Transformers and okay. but like the the volume was too low to hear any of the dialogue and I was like this is a much better movie when I can't hear it because <laughs> <laughs> we just got to sit there and like make fun of it <laughs> oh yeah but um actually what did you oh. Might be a, that might be a spoiler issue. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, well, kind of. I mean, you can kind of assume that this is going to happen because it's about the building of the Death Star, right? Right, yes. Um, and that was in all the trailers was, ooh, look at that Death Star. Ooh, look at that. Look at that, look at that, look at that. <laughs> all right, um, but when the Death Star fired mm-hmm. and the effects on the ground, what did you guys think of that? Because it, it didn't quite match up from... What we were seeing versus... It looked like a zit popping to me. Wait, when what fired? The Death Star fired, so the effects on the ground. Oh. So, wow. like, um, watching watching, watching the boom happen. It, it didn't look so, like a regular explosion. I guess movies that have explosions that make it look like an actual explosion. Like it right, there wasn't fire. Yeah. It was like, it didn't, yeah. like... Yeah. It was, it was a lot of, of debris, of dust being yes. thrown around. It's yeah. just like, ooh, an explosion, dust everywhere. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's also, actually my question was on the radius, because from the, the space view looking in, it looked like it was just a boop, kind of going out and like with, um, sort of like a, a ring, no, what was it? It looked like things were cracking, but it didn't look like the giant shockwave that they actually showed on the ground scene was going out quite like that. Hmm, hmm. Yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to watch more carefully again. Um, but like they, they had at the center definitely... Uh, kind of this this plume coming up, which is why I said that it looked kind of like a zit, you know, popping. Um, and from the ground, you could see all of that, you know, becoming like a sheer vertical mass of of formerly Earth now uh, is in the sky. Yeah, space dust. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, Stardust. Stardust. Yeah, that's a good movie too. <laughs> um, so next question is: Do we want to have? Sort of a final generic thoughts before we jump into the spoilers. Probably. Section. Oh, but yeah, before even before we do, do that, there's a, another couple of spoiler-free things that I want to talk about. Shutting up. Um, so speaking of the Death Star, that scene uh, where this was actually a scene that they kind of put in the trailers as well, um, but where they they start off showing like a star destroyer, right? Which we understand is a very very large ship. And then, like, there's this yeah. big shadow on the Star Destroyer. And it's like, who, who, what's that? And then, like, the, the Star Destroyer kind of, cut, like, travels out of the shadow. And the, the camera kind of zooms out at the same time. I mean, I thought it was a moon at first. Yeah. And, then, and then we That's see no that it's the Death Star. <laughs> like, that, I think, more than anything else, that helped me to get a sense of the scale of this thing. Yeah. So... So that like that one shot was just like amazing, amazing. I have to wonder, just on an engineering perspective, how would that work? Because bodies that are usually that big <laughs> have a molten core because they have so much gravity and pressure from everything else. Uh, well, I mean, side. like our moon doesn't have a molten core, I think, um, and the Death Star is smaller than our moon. Okay, yeah. doesn't it? Uh, I would have to look again to to see, but I I'm pretty sure that it does not because it doesn't have like tectonic activity on it, right? Tectonic plates. Yeah. I'm studying Earth. I'm um, studying that stuff. I'm studying analyses Earth. of the Moon's time variable rotation indicate that the core is at least partially molten. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um. And I mean, even if it wasn't completely molten, how how would you deal with that much heat and that much pressure? Yeah, gra- gravity sh- is going to oh, want to pull sure. everything in. Yep. Um, You're basically creating... Well, no, yeah. Although, given that it is a space station, there's a lot more empty space in it than there would be if if this was a moon of the same size. True. Right? Because that's, that's kind of a, a mass. One solid mass. Um, one thing that's kind of frustrating to me uh, is that, um, and this is something that I complained about when... when uh, the Force Awakens came out is that it's th- the Force Awakens is thirty years after Episode Six, right? Okay. And yet they're using the exact same like 
military technology as they were 30 years ago, right? We're seeing them flying around in X-Wing fighters. They're flying around in regular TIE fighters. This movie, Rogue One, takes place literally hours before the beginning of A New Hope. And in this movie, we get to see a few new vehicles that we've never seen before in the Star Wars saga. So it's like, man, what, what are they thinking? What are they doing? I don't know. I'm not thinking the same way you think. Clearly. Clearly. Maybe they should hire me. I mean, didn't 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 we use you know the P fifty one Mustang for up until we were done with like the Vietnam War? I don't think so. They were well into jets by the Vietnam War. That's supposed to be sarcasm. Oh. Good. I what? <laughs> <laughs> Sarcasm detector malfunction. I know. There's a bit of a chasm in our understanding. Gosh. Um and then the last thought that I had, uh, before we move into spoilers, is that um something that they did in, in The Force Awakens as well is they they're using hyperspace in very different ways that I'm than I I understand it to be, right? Um, But I think that I'm just going to have to accept that my understanding is false now because they changed canon. So, uh, yeah. So I guess you can, like, send and receive transmissions while you're in hyperspace. Uh, Well, in... in, Yeah. Wait, weren't you... In usual hyperspace, aren't you traveling faster than light? You know, they still haven't been very specific about that, like, because there's kind of two possibilities. Either hyperspace is you're you're straight up just traveling faster than light through regular space, or hyperspace is, like, the kind of thing where you're tunneling through another dimension that, like, essentially shortens the distance that you have to travel, mm. right? So either way, one, you're out of the dimension for one, so you shouldn't be able to receive communication, and two, you're traveling faster than light, which means that the light which we use for communication wouldn't be able to catch up to you. So, right, but yeah, no. but who says that they use light for communication? Fair point. Exactly. Yeah, because they they clearly can right, send. They, an, sound. they can <laughs> they can they clearly can like um, have a real time hologram transmission between different planets. So they're obviously like their transmissions don't travel at regular light speed. It could be that they open up, like, a hyperspace wormhole kind of thing and then just, like, shoot light through that. So that would be going faster than a ship going through hyperspace, in theory, if, like, light speed still applies when you're in hyperspace. I but don't then what know. about G-forces? I don't know, exactly. <laughs> I, I have no idea. Fine, I'll stop adding reality. Add yeah. reality to everything. I mean, while we're at it, how do lightsabers work? <laughs> Uh, Press that button. The powered by alternative facts. <laughs> oh god. All right. So a few final spoiler-free thoughts. I mean, in general, I I, I enjoyed the movie. I saw it what three times or something. Like mm-hmm. that. Um, it it plays on the Star Wars universe and well-known parts of the Star Wars universe, and that was fun. It does explore a little bit of new stuff, but not enough to really make it interesting. Whether that be in terms of characters or technology. Um, so it was a fun story, but it was not amazing. Yeah, I I really enjoyed it. Um, in terms of Star Wars movies that have come out in my adult lifetime, it's definitely my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't have much competition there yet. First, um, the first time I saw Rogue One was with my with my class at school. Yeah, you're so lucky. It was pretty cool. Yeah, they they, they, they literally took us on field trips the day before winter break. You can go on a ton of field trips. So one of them was going to go see Rogue One with like two other classes. So you mean I hate you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, how did you, how did you feel about it? Yeah, yeah, I was just like, why is? Uh, I was just for for a while. I was just like, why does this one exist? Like, should it really be happening? Like, should all this stuff really be happening? Like, 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 are you questioning why they made the movie or why the events were happening in the movie? The events. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was kind of like the beginning of the movie didn't seem to tie into like the whole stealing the Death Star plans yeah, quite yet. Yeah. The, Cause the beginning is more like a flashback of showing like, oh, this, the main character was little. That's mm-hmm. how I kind of saw it. Mm. Like, now she's on the ship with a ton of monsters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um yeah, it it did it did kind of take a little while to get going, uh especially with like how much they were jumping around from planet to planet at the beginning of the movie. Um but yeah, I I mean, I felt very satisfied 
uh, when we left when we left the theater the first time that we watched it. Ours cannot be satisfied. <laughs> so so yeah, I definitely uh, I definitely recommend this movie um, much more than than The Force Awakens, uh, and I guess we'll have to see where the rest of the Force Awakens trilogy goes. Uh, <laughs> They, they they could they could bring it back in my mind in you know in, in uh but we don't know right now right now I'm not so hot on the uh the current trilogy that they're doing. I mean I'm not gonna lie, I do have a bit of a crush on Daisy Ridley. Sure. But that's not the only thing in a movie. No. Yeah. But she's the only thing that matters. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Alright, so time for some spoilers. Dun 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 Think that that means that I don't have to go and actually edit the episode. <laughs> Please, I'm an endless supply of dun dun duns. <laughs> uh, Foley artist with his mouth. Can we start with something towards the end of the movie that I just thought of? It's like towards the end of the movie. Well, everybody dies towards the end of the movie. <gasps> well, Surprise! Well, yes. Okay. And okay. you get a death, and you get a death, and you get a death. Everybody gets a death. Another one bites the dust. <laughs> Another one bites the dust. Come on. I'm gonna get you. So what did you want to talk about at the end of the movie? Okay, so the ship that they take out, because, like, they're just like, who, what group is taking out the ship? And they're just like, Rogue One is taking Mm. out the ship. Mm -hmm. Like, that reminded me of Stargate, the, their jumpers. Oh, Puddle Jumper? Yes. Yeah. I was just like, Puddle Jumper! (laughs) (laughs) Except, of course, that uh, they didn't name the entire TV show after the Puddle Jumpers. (laughs) Yeah. Then I was just like, wait, nobody around me knows what this is. Mm, mm-hmm. I'm just like nobody understands what now you now you understand my life right I'm always laughing at things that are in my own head and then I realize that nobody else yep. has the I same context I always do the 540 thing like whenever I'm around, I'm around I like my friends I'm just like hey it's 540 hey, like, what? guess what time it's going to be in 3 minutes 540 yep. what, what's the significance of 540 <laughs> when weird because you and I like you forced me to watch all of these things so that at least somebody gets your references so 540 is not actually a reference to a show or anything like that um, it's a reference of me yeah, so when Tanushu was a tiny child, one day uh, at church, like while we were cleaning up after maybe a Cub Scout event or something like that, Tanushu has a ruler, and she just walks up to random items, measures it with the ruler, and goes, 540! Ha 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 ha! And then she like walks over to another item, 540! Ha 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 ha! And she starts like walking up to people and like measuring like their arms, 540! Ha 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 ha! See, this is why we do need this to be a live show, so that people can see your face when you're doing the ha-ha-ha-ha. <laughs> Take a picture, it'll last longer. Ew, <laughs> Um, But yeah, so so everybody dies at the end of this movie. All of the main characters. Uh, well, okay, the, they do, like, the, movie, the very main character. You mm-hmm. don't really exactly see her dying, or uh, dead, or well, getting. Well, okay, so the Death Star shoots the planet. Okay, and they're yeah, and they're fits. hugging on the beach, and then it fades to white, right? Damn! Like, okay, that explosion okay. definitely engulfed them. It's like my yeah. zombie dream. What zombie dream? Engulfed in white. Yeah, he had a, he has a crazy like time travel zombie apocalypse. I, like, yeah, dream. my dreams are either about my teachers living on the streets. So. <laughs> um. Okay. So. I mean, never be your teacher. <laughs> so yeah. So let's let's talk about. Everybody dying because that is very, very strange in not only in and a Star Wars dies, movie. And then, like, going on to the next movie, I guess. Yeah. The, but also, like, like where did... in, in, like, American media in general, we hardly ever get stories where everybody dies. Because plot armor. Yeah, exactly. Because. Um, although they all had plot armor until they were done serving their part. Plot armor? <laughs> armor? I'm very armory. Not so so yeah like i was i was impressed that they were able to craft a movie where they kill off all their main characters uh and yet the movie still felt satisfying at the end um and i'm sure that not everybody felt the same way as i did but like i thought that it was very well done they they um you know the arc felt complete i just felt very right. tired <laughs> <laughs> uh so what like I'm curious about when you two realized that they were probably all going to die because I think that everybody kind of came to that realization at different times when they were when they were watching the movie. I think um right I think it was sort of like in the beginning of the movie where like 
Yes. Really? Yes. You you knew yes. that all the characters were going to die right yeah, away. Yeah, I was just like, oh, I bet all these characters are going to die. My aunt thought that ten minutes into the Sixth Sense that she was that they were or sorry that the kid was actually the um or not the sorry that Bruce Willis was actually dead. At the okay, maybe not so, so in the beginning of the movie. I guess I don't know. What I part. haven't seen that. What? Don't worry about it. Okay. Like, the part where she's like, I'm going to go look for my father. Is that, like, throughout the whole entire movie? Just, like, starting from the beginning? Kind of. I mean, she didn't really have that goal until the Rebel Alliance uh, kidnapped her and told her, like, we know where your father, or, like, we're trying to find your father. So about at that part, I was just like, oh, almost everybody's going to die at some point soon. Okay. <laughs> for me, it was towards the final battle when um, uh, the monk guy and the heavy... We're on the beach. We're on the beach. Mm -hmm. And got <clears throat> got bloated up. Mm -hmm. I think. Oh. Let's see. Who was the first main character to die? I think it was Bodhi, Bodhi. the the pilot. Yeah, either Bodhi or B eighty eight or whatever. K two S O. K two S O. Not even close. Not even close. <laughs> remember what we were saying about names? Actually, the only person who is from this movie whose name I remember is Galen, and that's because one, Matt Mickelson played him, and two, my brother's name is Galen. <laughs> that's pretty great. Um, yeah, I think the mo the moment when I was pretty sure that they were all going to die was when they were coming down towards the planet where they were going to steal the Death Star plans, and they had to go through the planetary shield, right? And so they so they were going through that yeah. like doorway essentially. Yeah. I was like, this this is a barrier, right? They they're not gonna come back from this. You know, it's it's like when you're in a video game and you have to yeah, jump sorry. down off of a you know a, like kind of a ledge that you know you're not gonna be able to jump back up to and it's like okay there's no going back from this moment. Or making different choices throughout the game like yeah, yeah. So, so as soon as they went down there, I was like, "They're not coming back from this planet. They're gonna get the the Death Star plants, and they're gonna get it to Princess Leia, but they're not gonna make it back. They're, they're just gonna die." Yeah. Eh, they did. Hey. <laughs> I was like, but they, but they haven't done done the squishy of the leg parts yet. The what? What on earth are you talking they about? They didn't have sex yet. Oh, sure. Okay, so you were going for that for that romantic subplot, huh? For that ship. You <laughs> You were? I'm I'm personally really really glad that they did not force that into a romantic subplot. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm not glad or not glad about it. I'm actually indifferent about it, but I was expecting it to happen because that's what happens in a lot of Right. American in a lot of yes, American media. Yes, I was media. expecting it to happen, but I'm just like, wait, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. What is mm -hmm. going on? And I'm just like, oh, wow. Like, they, they, had, they had maybe two kind of stolen glances throughout the movie, I think, between the two of them. Um, and, and then, like, the platonic hug at the end as they're dying. But, like, why the heck would you not hug the person next to you if you're about to die from a Death Star bomb? Yeah. 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 No matter who it was. Um, let's talk about Darth Vader. Because this is this is one of those few movies, and it, this is one of the reasons that I'm really excited for these anthology films, you know, that are outside of, like, the main series, is that, like, Jedi and Sith are going to be way, way less common. Mm. And so when one shows up, it's a big deal and they deal. and they really capitalized on that in this movie right um because when when like uh director krennic has to go and talk to vader it's a big deal you know he's like fearing for his life except that he's also uh you know a sniveling conniving sob uh and and, and still tries to like you know get out on top from yeah he's pathetic yeah he's um but like but when they but but then when they had Vader the second time he appears in the movie, right? Is when he's in the he's, hallway. Yeah, and he's killing all those people. Mm -hmm. that, that that made my day at yeah. that point. Oh yeah. <laughs> because now we're seeing Vader from the perspective of the regular foot yeah. soldiers, right? It's Instead like of using from the lightsaber and uh -huh. like the force, and I'm just like I was the only one yelling at During that During that point. scene, I was actually really pissed because it's like, there's so many more effective ways to kill all of these people. Stop <laughs> dicking around and get on with it. <laughs> well, guess what? He was dicking around. Uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, he... <sighs> Yeah, he could have done it faster. Yes, and I and I I was thinking throughout that whole thing, like the guy who had the Death Star plans in his hands, right, and the yeah. door is slightly open in yeah. front of him. I was like. Okay, how long is it going to take for him to figure out that he can just shove the plans through the door and he doesn't have to go through the door? Because, like, 
I know that the plants have to leave that room. Yes. You know, and I know what the obvious solution is. I mean, yes. From from his point of view, he's like, shit, shit, shit. I still have a chance. 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 Let me have. But we know that. No. No. Nope. Yeah. So, I mean, so I mean, if you were in a death situation and in fight or flight response and flight had kicked in, do you really think that you would be completely logical? I have no idea. But I I do know that like if I, I mean if I was told that my primary objective was to get these plans right, mm -hmm. then as soon as I get that door slightly ajar and people are running by out there, I'll probably like toss it through and then keep trying to open the door to save my own life. But there's no reason that I have to keep opening trying to open the door while the plans are still in my hand. <laughs> yeah. You know. Um. Now, yes, you did mention that Vader. They did something really weird with him. In this movie. Sassy Vader. Punny Vader, even. Like, that, oh man, I was not expecting that. And I, I like, I definitely groaned out loud when he did that. Um, so let's see, the, the exact pun was, uh, so he's choking Krennig with the force, as Vader does. And then he says, take care not to choke on your own aspirations. Like, no, at no point... In the prequel trilogy or in the original trilogy, does Anakin or Darth Vader indicate that he understands wordplay at all? <laughs> like, not only is he like too broody to to make puns like that, but I I he also doesn't seem clever enough. <laughs> so going back to the part on when the he's when the guy's handing the plans so it can get to, to mm -hmm. Slayer, um. Like what I was thinking is Darth Vader is like they don't we don't want them to get these plans like is that what like was he trying to get make sure they didn't get the plans through or? what Vader was trying to do yeah 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 what he could have done is just shut the door before he before he wasn't even able oh to yeah with the force them. yeah 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 that's but then again that's assuming that he knows that what he's trying to hand off or what that soldier is trying to hand off is the plans wow. yeah I'm uh what let's see because they 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 disabled. The capital ship, right? The flagship. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Vader goes and boards it. So the, he clearly had a reason to go and board it. Uh, and I think that that reason was because they realized that a transmission had been sent up to that ship. But yes, but how would Vader know that that individual soldier was True. carrying yeah. the plans? Yeah, yeah. Um, aside aside like... from the Force, possibly. Yeah. Because to him, it probably just looked like, oh, here's another current trying to get away. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, there's yeah, I mean, there's, again, there's no reason for him to like be walking through every single hallway in that capital ship trying to kill every single person. If he just wanted way. to, if yeah. he just wanted to kill every single person, they could have just blown it out of the sky. Yeah, yeah. You know? and why didn't they? I'm not. I think it was because the transmission made it up there, and they wanted. I feel like to, sh they, if, to get rid of the transmission, to... they could have just destroyed it. Yeah. I feel like they're trying to make it have like this dramatic scene where Darth Vader comes in. And oh. he's... Yeah, no, obviously it's the dramatic the effect, but we're trying to put logic to this. <laughs> we're trying to figure out why the characters did that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah. actually, he might have known that it was him because, or sorry, as Invader might have known that that was the grunt carrying the the transmission because when that life pod detached and went away, mm -hmm. he was standing at that door and watching it go away and then turned around in a huff. Right, 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 right. Um... Is it, ugh, it? It can't be. It can't be that Vader was like trying, like letting them go, in order to like find out where they took take the information to find more rebels. Although that is a move that he tried over and over and over again in Episode Four, and well, <laughs> ultimately bit them in the butt. I mean, do you know about the definition of insanity? Um. Yeah, according to somebody who wasn't a psychologist. Yeah. I don't know, but it makes for a pretty dang good monologue from. Uh, my favorite bad guy in Far Cry Three. Oh, I thought you were making a like a Joker reference. Did no. the, did the Joker reference that? I don't know. Mm. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> let's talk about one of the biggest things that affected my enjoyment of the movie, and that is the characters from Episode Four who appear in the Rogue One, and how they managed to get them in there. For example. Grand Moff Tarkin. Wow. Peter Cushing has been dead for a very, very long time. So what do they do? They have some other guy who is approximately his height and build playing the character, and then they CGI Grand Moff Tarkin's face over his face. 
Did we have? Did he record the voice lines long ago then? No, definitely not. No, oh, they this didn't. Is completely different. This is that. Yeah, it's got to be. They did a really good job with the voice. Yes. Yeah. Um. But the yeah the the CGI for for Grand Moff Tarkin that was squarely in the Uncanny Valley. Like I w- I was feeling kind of ill watching it because I was just so like it's almost human but not quite human. There's something seriously wrong here. Just like your face, <laughs> my face. Hey. Um. On the other hand, when they did Princess Leia, that was really that really was, good. That was mm-hmm. yeah. And I think the difference there is that. Uh, well, A, Grand Moff Tarkin had a lot more screen time, yeah. but also he's a lot older, right? So his his face has a lot more like wrinkles and just like distinctive features and things like that. Um, whereas Leia's face is smoother. Um, you know, you can probably get away with like putting CGI makeup on her, right? And you know, so so you know, her face isn't as oh, that like she would it. Be it that. It's not just like her, yeah. It's it's not her base face. Yeah, you know she it she would is. also have some makeup on. Yeah. Yeah, she's. Um. Yeah, and then the other the other like characters were sometimes like a few of the pilots that they had in the space battle, right? Um. They they had some of the same characters uh, from like Red Squadron and Gold Squadron, right? Um. And I think what they did for those is they had some like unused footage from Episode Four. That they went and found of, you know, like, footage from the cockpits of those pilots. Uh, and and kind of, like, you know, touched them up digitally and, and made them sound good. Um, there was one or two, like, lines that, that I swear are the, like, they use the exact same sound files from episode four. And that kind of almost took me out of the, <laughs> you know, the, like, the movie watching experience. Because I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> nah, I've heard that exact thing, thing, same thing before. <clears throat> Um, but those, like, they did those really well. Yeah. Um, the Rebel Alliance that we get to see in this movie, um, I was, I learned a lot from that experience because in the original trilogy, right, in episodes four, five, and six, all we see is the Rebel Alliance being a cohesive unit, right? Mm -hmm. They have, they have one goal. They have a clear, like, military hierarchical structure, right? One person's in charge and everything. Yeah. Um, and in Rogue One, for the first time, we get to see them being very indecisive uh, and having like a lot of different people with different goals in mind. Uh, and that was that was really fascinating to me um, because like <laughs> merely hours before the original movie, they couldn't decide on whether they wanted to go to war or not, which is like all that we've ever known of the Rebel Alliance. Yeah. So. So it's really interesting to learn that like there were people at the highest levels of the Rebel Alliance who were like, "Yeah, we're like, <laughs> we we can't win this war, so we probably shouldn't start it at all." Um, and that was like the whole kind of one of one of the central points of the movie is is, um, you know, not like like taking taking decisive action, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and convincing everybody that that was the right thing to do. Feels a lot like uh, Mass Effect. Yeah, we, we have to go specifically Mass Effect Three, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, where you have to get all of the different species on board with. Oh man, yep, 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 yep. My friend was telling me about how he did a uh, all the way through three. He did a Renegade playthrough of Mass Effect Three, and he shot Morden in the back. Ooh, and he was he was hating himself for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think I'd be able to do that. Whenever I do a Renegade run through, uh, I have to like very clearly in my mind separate myself from the main character from Shepard because I hate everything that that Renegade Shepard does. Shepard. Um, I did find it rather strange in that battle. Um, that the so so the reason that the Rebel Alliance even entered that battle was because they got a transmission saying that um. That, that the planet was under attack, right? And that, like, the Empire was, was you know, going to send forces to, to defend it. Um, and so one general just decided, like, okay, I'm going to take my people and I'm going to go and help. Uh, and so then all of the other, like, military generals uh, in the Rebel Alliance were like, well, okay, if, you know, if we're sending some troops, we might as well, like, actually commit. And so that's why the whole fleet went in. Yeah. And that one general um, was an X-Wing pilot. That was weird. So there's a general who is who is leading a squadron of X-wings. Um, I mean, kind of weird. 
I mean, you also have to remember that in the do Air Force use generals in that? No, whole exactly. Yeah, that's one of the other reasons, right? Is that the the starfighters are usually attached to the navy, yeah. right? So they use like admiral and th- those kinds of uh, uh, positions. Yeah. So. Yeah, that was a little strange. Um, but also, but also, just straight up like seeing somebody that who's that high ranking being on the front lines. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the last note that I have here about uh, the Rebel Alliance is what the heck is up with that hammerhead, the hammerhead cruiser? Like, I... best strategic decision ever. I'm surprised oh, that they didn't man. actually do that earlier. Any of them? Um. Well, I think I think they had to disable the star destroyer first, like. With the ion cannons, uh, before or whatever it was that the, you know they took down the yeah. main reactor, uh, before they could send in the hammerhead, uh, to push it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, d- I think they couldn't have done it earlier because it wasn't disabled yet. Oh yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, just the the whole concept behind the hammerhead is insane. <laughs> and and I can I I'd like to imagine the person who designed the hammerhead just like drawing up the plans and going, yeah, this is really gonna this is gonna mess with them when they when they bring this into battle. Maybe it's just like maybe that's one of the ships that they have for after the battle. Like, hmm. Oh, to tow push. things around. Yeah. Mm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they and the uh, the admiral decided to use it a little creatively yes yeah oh speaking of um ships that you don't usually bring into battle one of the ships that they had in the rebel fleet was definitely a cargo ship like it was the same exact model as the cargo ships that they were trying to escape from hoth with and that they were like having to defend these things because they have like no weapons of their own whatsoever so i'm not sure why that ship was there over scarif um yeah (laughs) just logic yeah um, let's talk about uh, some other non-character cameos that we see in this movie that are, you know, references to other things uh, from from the from the series. Um, obviously, R two D two and C three PO make it in there. Yeah. <laughs> they kind of have to, I guess. Yeah. Suppose. Yeah, and it. And I mean, it did make sense for them to be on Yavin four when that ha- when you know when we see them, um, because Princess Leia was apparently on Yavin four at the time. Yeah. So. Um, of course, they they stick in Ponda, Baba, and Evazan, um, the two guys from from the Cantina in Episode Four, who uh, have the death sentence on twelve systems. That's right. You'll be dead. Yeah, those guys. Yeah. Um, and yet yeah, that one felt a little bit weird that they that they just kind of bumped into these guys in the middle of a marketplace because it was a completely different planet. All of a sudden. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, of course, they had like that Yavin Four lookout, um, but that you know, I mean, they were in the same base, um, and so th- that was kind of a nice touch to to make it seem familiar, right? Um, I, I there were a few lines that you hear um, throughout the movie that kind of like tie into other lines that you hear in other movies that you know they all seem like throwaway lines, but when you take them all together, it it helps to build this cohesive world um so in star wars episode four uh some of the stormtroopers who are walking around um you know when they're talking about like do you know what's going on like maybe this is a drill and then you know they're just kind of like talking about stuff and Mm -hmm. have you heard about the new t-16s oh yeah yeah some of the guys are talking about them they say that they're quite the things to see and in this movie in rogue one uh we hear what some of like the stormtroopers who are walking around going yeah i hear that they've uh, made the t-15 obsolete (laughs) <laughs> yeah so it's like it's not yeah it's 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 different lines but they're still but they're talking about the same thing i didn't pay attention to those things in the I have, prob- I have problem with noticing things so if like if you tell me to notice those things i will look out for them but mm-hmm. yeah I, I just yeah i don't notice those things i have the problem that i've just seen all the star wars movies way too many times like, so I have I like know all of the background lines and everything. I mean, if you want to call that a problem, sure. But... <laughs> <laughs> it well, you know, I've forgotten more about Star Wars than most people know in their entire lifetime. So, um, death troopers are now a thing. So the the bodyguards that um, Director Krennic has with him, uh, the dar- the the stormtroopers that are in dark armor, yeah. um, those are kind of those. Those are one of those things that they've pulled from the old expanded universe and kind of switched them up a little bit. Um, they in the old canon they were called dark troopers, I believe. Yes. Um, 
because they had that same thing on Star Wars Battlefront 2. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and now they are called Death Troopers, which is a name that existed for, like, these zombie stormtroopers that were in, like, this one novel, and we'll all just agree to try and forget about that one. Um, but so so the, the stormtroopers that have black armor are now called Death Troopers, and they're purpose appears not to be like commando like frontline troopers but essentially bodyguards for like really high ranking officials they're like the immortals from the uh battle of thermopylae oh okay okay yeah. from 300 well well from the battle of thermopylae yes, <laughs> yes well okay but that but that is the the 300 spartans versus right yes that's yeah yes so yes the story from the the graphic novel turned movie um well, the inspiration for the story um, was the Battle of Thermopylae, which was during the Second Persian War when King uh, Xerxes mm -hmm. came back to try and stomp out the Greek Empire, which had um, pooped all over his his dad's army, mm -hmm. King Dyrus. Yep. Um, and yeah, no, he had a personal bodyguard that were called the Immortals. There you go. Um, and yeah, it was. I mean, it was. It was rather. I'm not sure. <laughs> they definitely were like outfitted, almost like commandos, right? Like looking at all of the gear that they have strapped to them and like the the guns that they're carrying. Um, but they but their job is bodyguarding. Uh, so I mean, unless they're howling, they're not real commandos. <laughs> um, and I I was kind of disappointed by the fact that apparently we had to change their armor color in order to make any stormtroopers effective because I had high hopes that this was going to be the movie where we were going to see regular white armored stormtroopers being effective against the main characters of the movie. But guess I what? Mean, we did it! They killed no. our, our, our sassy robot friend. Uh, the, oh, yeah, those were regular stormtroopers. That's true. Yeah. Didn't um, they also throw the grenade it, into the ship and destroy Rogue One? And... Uh, well, yeah, but that but that's like after you know the after the 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 main characters have encountered stormtroopers many times throughout the movie right and yeah. yeah i mean they were so dumb their military tactics were so dumb it's like her her we're gonna all come out of this small area i like having a choke point where we can all oh the, the stormtroopers yeah. all coming out of the bunker in the yeah. same doorway yeah speaking of thermopylae <laughs> um yeah so Cause yeah, I mean, like I I was okay with the excuse that in the like original trilogy and everything, the stormtroopers we always see them going up against the the heroes of the story who are like you know way outclass the stormtroopers. Yeah. Um, slash also in a lot of those cases they had like orders to let the the heroes escape, you know. Um, but in this in this movie that was obviously not the case, and yet. The stormtroopers still cannot hit anything unless the stormtroopers are wearing black armor. Yeah. Dumb. Yeah. Uh, now the space battle. Oh man, I think this might be my favorite space battle of any Star Wars movie. It was good. Possibly, possibly with the exception of the Battle of Coruscant at the beginning of Episode Three. Um, but yeah, this is just like, like I said before. Hearing all of the classic sound effects of the this X wings flying around and their lasers, and seeing for the first time like just swarms and swarms of Tie fighters, right? Because in the expanded universe, they always talk about how the Tie fighters were designed to be small and cheap and light, and they just manufacture tons and tons of them, and they send as many of them out into the battle as possible to just overwhelm the enemy with numbers. And this was the first time that I really felt that overwhelming, like just. There are so many TIE Fighters on the screen that you just can't handle it. Yeah, no, I... Actually, my favorite part was still the hammerhead part, as much as we made fun of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. While it was happening, I just, like, I was looking over at Caleb and Jonas going, like, what the heck are they doing? <laughs> and, like, the space station didn't look like it was terribly big. I was surprised that they didn't just have one of the cannons on the big ship uh -huh. just attack the the ring itself. Right. Yeah. 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 The the aperture that that kept the shield up, yeah. essentially. Yeah. 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 Um, actually, I'm kind of curious. So so this is the first time that we've seen a planetary shield in like official canon. And and that was really exciting because we've seen planetary shields in like the expanded universe a bunch of times before, but usually on like core worlds like Coruscant or or you know Alderaan or whatever that that 
actually have a substantial population. Um, but yeah, see, like just seeing that it's it's straight up a thing now is is really exciting. Um, and I'm a little bit yeah, I'm a little bit confused about why destroying that aperture destroyed the shield because I think that the shield is like projected from the ground. And then the purpose of that aperture was to create a small hole, right, um, where the shield didn't exist. So it kind of interrupted that whole that the whole shield thing. Uh, and then, so then I would imagine if you take away the aperture, blow it up, then the shield just keeps that yeah. closed. But apparently, if you run a star destroyer into it, then that takes down the shield in that section. Maybe the mass of the star destroyer was enough to just overwhelm that particular shield generator mm. and take it down the shield in that on that section of the planet. Totally possible. Um, I think that's going to be my headcanon until I do further further research. <laughs> <laughs> Slash, they come out with more information. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Uh, and of course, I mean, they always, they come out with like the reference books for, for the movies, uh, pretty soon after they come out. Um, but I'm not sure, you know, cause they, I feel like they should almost wait for like the fan base to come up with all of the questions that need to be answered. Um, but you know, they got to sell books, right? Yep. Um, it was very interesting. The, towards the, be the beginning part of the movie where they're on, uh, Jeddah. You know the the kind of deserty planet, yeah. um, and dealing with the the Imperials are like taking all these crystals from this planet and everything. And there's this um, um, Saw Gerrera, you know, who used to be like associated with the Rebel Alliance, but now he's you know he's kind of gone and done his own thing because he is, uh, in the words of the characters in the movie, an extremist, right? Um, one of the things that he does is he you know he's interrogating Bodhi, the pilot who brings him the information, uh, and he, after getting the information from Bodhi, he gives him to this like this creature called the Borgullet, like that has like glowy. Oh, <laughs> you can... <laughs> you cannot hide your secrets from the Borgullet. You cannot hide your secrets <laughs> from the Borgullet. <laughs> Every time I think of the Borgullet, now I think of the Kylo Ren review. Save the dream. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like I, I can't figure out what purpose the Borgullet served in the movie, right? Because like you know that he believes him. I get, but he still didn't trust him even after he fed him to the Borgullet. I keep <laughs> saying feeding him, but it didn't eat him. Yeah, um, did. But like he didn't. He's like even when Jin gets there, he the, the Sagarer is like, this is a trap, isn't it? Like the the whole message, you coming here, like this is all a trap. And uh, so he still didn't trust the information, even though the Borgola told him that Bodhi was telling the truth. Um, maybe he's just that... Um, untrustworthy. Well, maybe not untrustworthy. Uh, oh, she was... Paranoid? Paranoid, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, like, the the other thing that the Borgola might have done is, you know, he talks about how the Borgola tends to, uh, like, scramble somebody's mind, right? To make them insane. And Bodhi had like one scene where he you know was kind of incoherent mm -hmm. and i was really worried when they did that i was like oh gosh are we gonna have to deal with this guy like not being understandable for the rest of the movie luckily no he gets his mind back but then it's like well why why have the borg at all and the only reason i can think of is to like show how extreme he is mm -hmm. how how extreme Saul Guerrero is right um but if there were no consequences to what the borg did to bodhi then we don't really see that, like, you know, that it that doesn't really communicate to us how uh, how extreme he is. Um, we just we're, we're told that the Borgullet can can scramble your brains, but we don't ever see it yeah. in the movie. So I yeah, I thought that was a little weird. Um, and then yeah, I just have some other like miscellaneous thoughts in here. Um, <laughs> first up is uh, the the team at the landing pad. Must be the most unobservant bunch of people ever, because an Imperial officer, whose face is clearly visible, right? Yep. Goes in with uh, a single, uh, like the 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 the. I don't even know what that what what that person's role is, but the one who has like the sticks attached to their back, you know, and yeah. they've got like the black helmet. Um, they go in with that person, and I think were there two stormtroopers with them, maybe so. as an escort. Yeah. So four people go into the ship to inspect it, 
Uh, and then three, well, two people come out. One of them is wearing an Imperial officer's uniform, but he clearly has a different face. The other person is in the black uniform, and then a droid. Yeah. <laughs> How did that not raise some flags? It, apparently it didn't. Well, that's why they can't hit anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, the, another thing that kind of bothered me that um, still isn't like, okay, so I've, I've accepted now that, that hyperspace works differently than, than I think it does, right? You can send and receive transmissions while you're in hyperspace. Yes. However, when they were in hyperspace and uh, Cassian radios back to Yavin 4, right? And he's giving them an update on, on what the mission is, right? So they, they, they met up with Saw Gerrera, they found out where Galen is, they're going to continue on to the planet where Galen is, right? Yes. Uh, to try and apprehend him. And then he ends the transmission, and then Jin tells them what the message was that Galen had, and that there's a weakness, right? And and she's like, okay, so, so like, we gotta change the plan, right? Because we're not gonna be going, like, we, we need to go and get the plans for it, instead of going to find my dad right or something like that and and uh cassian was like no we 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 can't like radio yavin 4 because we're in the middle of enemy territory dude you just got off the radio what's the problem here that no (laughs) plot hole (sighs) are you gonna plan or fill it with retro oh yeah like um uh, what do you call that um retconning retconning thank you yes yep 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 possibly uh, and then my final little miscellaneous thought is, uh, why does Director Krennic get a white uniform? So that his employees can see him bleed. <laughs> like, my understanding of Imperial uniform hierarchy is that the white uniforms are only for Grand Admirals. And we do have Grand Admirals in canon now, because Grand Admiral Thrawn exists in Star Wars Rebels, uh, and he's getting a novel of his own very soon. Oh, goodness, that's coming out in, like, March, isn't it? I'm so excited. Um, I don't know. He's 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 like my favorite character in Star Wars, um, and yeah, up until now, like the Grand Admirals are the only ones who had white uniforms, and then suddenly we have Di- Director Krennic, who's got like a white uniform and a cape and everything. Uh, and so I was really confused when we saw the, him in the trailers. I was like, oh, is there is there some Grand Admiral in here? That's exciting. There are only like twelve of them in the whole galaxy. No, nope, he's the scientist, I guess. He's he's the uh, he's the the director. <laughs> director does not mean scientist. No, but, like, that, that, that is his role, right? Tarkin makes fun of him for, like, being a scientist, not being a military man. And that's that was Tarkin's, like, justification for taking over the project was, you're clearly not good at, like, patching security holes and everything because your specialty is building the damn thing. I didn't get that vibe. I got the vibe of, um, you're just inept and I want all the, this glory for myself. <laughs> um, yeah. The other thing about Director Krennic is that I'm, like, even though he's not a military dude, he's not afraid to get his hands dirty. Yeah. And that was really refreshing, like, seeing uh, an Imperial, like, the highest up, going out and just shooting people, right? <laughs> like, he was out there in the field getting stuff done when nobody else was, was really getting it done. Um, and that impressed me. So even even though like they they kind of portray him as this guy who isn't as effective, you know, the 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 uh the other officers don't seem to really take him seriously, especially Tarkin. Um and yet he goes and he takes care of things himself. Real hands on. Yeah. He should put that on his LinkedIn profile. Hands on manager. I mean, micromanager. Right. Yeah. Well, but you, you got to put it in a, in a positive spin, right? If you're if you're putting it on your profile. Yeah. Yeah, and I read that and go micromanager and go nope. <laughs> uh yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I really like this movie. I need to see it again. I can't wait for it to come out on on home video. Is that the plaza? Uh, probably, but I don't like theaters. I want to watch it in my house. Even though it's like two bucks at the plaza. Yeah, but I could not go and then i could buy it and then i save two dollars and a trip to the plaza do you know how long it takes to get to the plaza on bus probably quite a while that's why you asked to borrow my car yeah you know <sighs> anyways yeah any final thoughts on rogue one 
It was a terrible movie. Don't go ever see it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It was, it was fun. Mm-hmm. I, I, my final thoughts stay the same from before. Yep. Yep. I'm, yeah, it's, it's one that I actually, I think it got better for me as I read more about it, more of the information surrounding it, um, you know, the back, background stuff um, from the reference books. And uh, I still need to go and, and read um, Star Wars Catalyst, which is uh, the novel that has to do with Jin's parents back when she was, you know, a kid. Oh. And, and when he was, when Galen was working for Krennic the first time before they went and tried and hide as farmers. So, um, I've heard I've heard good things about that book, and I've bought it, and I need to read it. But I have, you know, no time in my life. So, what can you do? <laughs> Thanks for listening. Quit and do nothing for the rest of your life. Yeah, right. Then you'll have time to do everything. You'll support me, right, Ian? Just just pay for pay for my food and lodging and uh, and and my books, and, and that's it. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right, thanks for listening to this episode of Second Opinion, everybody. Uh, If you want to give us feedback on this episode, you can find The Nexus uh, on Twitter at TheNexusTV or email us at TheNexusTV at gmail.com. If you have any suggestions for topics that we can cover in the future on this show, uh, let us know. Or if you want to be on an episode and review something for us, we would love to have you. Uh, I have been Ian Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck. Uh, or you can check out my website, ianrbuck.com, for other things that I make. I'm Ian Decker. I don't really exist much on the internet, but in places that I do, um, I'm trying to get a little bit more on Twitter, so check out there for now. And that's uh, at Big Um, I'm Tina Shree. Um, uh, I don't have very much of, in the way of, like, internet stuff, but, like, besides Facebook and Instagram. There we go. Have a good one.